Hello everyone and welcome back. Today I'm going to be painting up some miniatures from the Battletech Box of Armored Combat in the style of the 13th Donegal Guards, a regiment from the Battletech universe. In so doing I'm going over a lot of interesting techniques that you may want to use in, in in some cases, quite a lot of depth, which means this episode's a bit longer than my usual episodes. To help you navigate around, the index does have timestamps, um, and you can skip to or skip over sections you don't want to watch or sections you specifically want to watch. I do recommend the section on jeweling if you are looking to learn how to quickly, quickly paint up pretty good looking battle mech miniatures. Um, now, this isn't by any means a massive, you know, display level paint job, but if you're a beginner and trying to get into it, this is all pretty simple techniques that hopefully you can incorporate and use to make good looking models for your own tabletop. The models I'm painting are displayed here. Uh, for most of the video, we're going to focus on the awesome, that's the battle mech in the center, but uh, the paint job applies to all of them, and at the end of the video, I've got some pictures of all of them painted up, so you can sort of take a look at how the techniques apply across them. For basing the miniatures, now these miniatures are already affixed to a base, but we're going to decorate it a little bit. I'm using baking soda and cat litter. Baking soda blends with cyanoacrylate glues, that's super glues, most of them anyway, just make sure they have cyanoacrylate in them, to make a sort of um, sandy, rough and ready uh, surface. It, it looks like dirt, uh, and it's a little more in scale than using actual sand, which tends to look a little large and rocky for a lot of miniatures. Uh, it also has the added benefit of helping affix miniatures down to the base. Of course, these miniatures come pre-mounted on these flat bases, so we don't need to glue them down. Uh, but, you know, for other miniatures that you may use at some point, gluing them down with the baking soda is pretty nice. I put down the cat litter to make some rocks and just a different sort of uh, variation in the texture. Some areas have big rocks, some areas have small rocks, that kind of thing. Um, and then I pour the baking soda over top because that's what sets up the cyanoacrylate and that's what makes the sandy texture. So by putting the cat litter on first, uh, that's just a clay cat litter by the way, unscented or whatever, uh, just what I have for my cats. And then uh, by putting on the baking soda afterwards, it fixes the cat litter and, uh, the, you know, if the model needed to be glued down, it would fix the model in place as well. And you can see you just sprinkle it around a little randomly and it just adds some texture and a little bit of visual interest to the base. So for priming my miniatures, I always use my airbrush. I do throw in the caveat here, you could just use a normal brush to, you know, apply the primer. But the primer I use, this Vallejo black primer, does tend to get bubbles in it and not sit perfectly flat when I apply it with a brush I've found. So you may want to use a different primer or maybe you found some way to make this one work, I don't know. Um, the other thing you'll want to watch out for is you don't want to apply it too thick because you don't want to fill in the actual details on the model, especially in this case where the panel lines are going to be sort of the bulk of the details since, you know, the robot doesn't have faces and a lot of attachments for us to be painting individually. We're going to be using those panel lines quite extensively to give it texture, so you really want to make sure they're not filled in. I will say though, an airbrush and a compressor is sort of the first tool I would recommend anyone get uh, to sort of step up their painting game if you're interested in painting models because it, uh, it makes a huge difference in how easily you can cover large areas and how you can prime, varnish, that kind of stuff. But yeah, you can do it without an airbrush. I, I just don't anymore. So now what I did is I grabbed some white acrylic paint. This is Vallejo airbrush white paint or whatever, or maybe it's the ink. Um, I had some consistency issues. You can see it's sort of speckling and making a starry sky sort of texture, but that's a user error. It's not the paint. I've, I've used this same sort of combination on a lot of other miniatures and it works just fine. And I'm, using, I'm applying it from above to make what's called a zenithal highlight. So that's like the light shining down on the miniature. It's making the top areas light and highlighted. Um, and that'll show through our paint later, and the dark, lower area is darker, and that'll show through the paint a little bit as well. It's also super useful for you as a painter to help you reference what should be light and dark areas as you keep on painting. So it's worth doing even if it won't show through your paint. For the cracking here, now that's kind of a weird title, um, but what I'm actually doing is I'm going to be applying a texture paint, and uh, I don't really get on with the, the, the really, really expensive, these Citadel paints, and I find a lot of their technical paints are kind of whatever. Um, but this Agrell and Earth, I just got a bottle recently out of curiosity. Um, and uh, while the bottles are kind of weird, you can use that little nub there, push the lid up, and then sort of sit it on top of there. And you see it sits open, and it's got that scoop full of paint for you to use. Um, it's a bit odd, and maybe a lot of you already know that, but uh, I, like I said, I haven't used a lot of Citadel paints. Um, but I found this one really interesting, and I found a lot of different uses for it. So what you want to do is you want to get a lot of it on your um, paintbrush and sort of scoop it up and then lay it down wherever you want to get crackled ground. So I'm putting it around the feet of the uh, battle mechs to make it look like they're, re they're really heavy, you know, they're crushing down the earth and it's cracking around their feet. Um, and I'm also gonna put it on the battle mechs themselves. 
Now the reason I'm showing off that needle is I'm going to be using that uh, in combination with the Ugal Earth to make battle damage. Um, and this is just an idea I had, and it actually turns out really cool. Um, you put this Agrelin Earth on areas that, you know, maybe took a shell hit or a laser burn or something like that. And because, uh, well, because it's meant to look like cracked earth, it's going to crackle away at the edges. Um, and if you use a needle or something sharp or just a different paintbrush or something to sort of hollow out the center, you can make it look like little craters and like the, um, the armor sort of bulge up around the impact and make some really quick and dirty, but... You know, this is a super simple technique, but it'll still be very effective, uh, even on miniatures this small. Just dab it on and make sure it's thick. Um, the crackling effect is more and more pronounced the thicker it is. Um, so even when you're picking out the center here, this is why I'm using sort of a needle and not just a paintbrush to draw stuff away. I'm using the needle to push it into the shapes that I want for the, um, the damage. And what you'll probably want to do, because it's sort of is very liquid at the start and doesn't hold a shape great and then sort of stiffens as it sets. Uh, just keep going in and resetting the shape you want um, two or three times maybe um, and eventually it'll dry up and then you don't want to mess with it too much or you're going to start flaking it off and removing that uh, texture paint. You can see how I made some pretty interesting designs here like uh, across the top shoulder there there's what looks like a stream of autocannon rounds and same thing across the, the shoulder here just you know someone with a, a quick firing autocannon left a stream of rounds across the actual mech and then you can put some other areas down like just a stray bullet hit or a laser or something like that. For applying the base coat itself, um, this is pretty simple uh, we're just going to throw it on over top of everything. Now you may want to put the Agrelin Earth on earlier and then prime over top of that for better adhesion and to hold it down, I don't know. Um, I've done that on other models, but in this case, because it was just an experiment, it was kind of the first time I was trying it out, I put the Agrelin Earth on after the primer, so whatever. Uh, it also messes with your color a little bit. But yeah, I'm going to use a really thick brush so I can apply it quickly and just sort of rough and ready and messily over the entire model. And I'm going to use this Vallejo Model Air Dunkelblau. Now I'm using these Vallejo paints, but you'll notice they're, they're airbrush paints or they're inks. Uh, you could use inks just like I've shown in previous videos, cheaper inks. I just had these Vallejo ones, you know, available, so I'm using them. I'm also going to introduce a new thing, and that is paletto vision um, to these videos where I'm going to show you my palette as I add things to help you see how I am blending my colors. Now this is a wet palette. I have another video on the channel on how to make this wet palette. So if you'd like to do the same, uh, obviously go check that out. And that would be, uh, you know, maybe some pretty useful to you. I've also got one on the little stands I'm using to hold my models. So, you know, little plugs for previous episodes. But yeah, so uh, Dunkelblau is a dark blue that already has some black to it. It's a, it's a darker sort of desaturated blue, but I'm going to add a little more black because I want this base coat, this very, very first one, to be really, really dark. Because this is the one that's going to be going into the actual shaded recesses. You know, it's going to go everywhere in the model, and then we're going to build up lighter colors from that to pull out the actual panels. So we want this to be pretty dark, but again, not too dark. I don't want a black shadow, I want a dark blue shadow. Because black shadows are going to look, um, they're going to stand out a little bit, um, insofar as there's not a lot of actually black stuff in real life. So... If you make just straight up black shadows, they're going to stand out, whereas if you make them sort of dark blue and then build up the same sort of color of blue on top, I find it looks more natural. So yeah, and I'm using this uh, thick brush here and I'm just throwing it on over top of everything. As I mentioned earlier, this uh, texture paint, the Agrelin Earth, might affect the color a little bit, but because we're going to throw on multiple layers over top, it's not that bad. Just if you see it sort of showing through right now while you're putting on this dark blue base coat and some areas look darker because they're brown underneath instead of white from the primer, and you followed this to the letter instead of going back and just doing things in a different order, uh, don't worry too much about it. Next up, I'm going to use the Dunkelblau itself, but unmodified. So not with any black mixed in, just that blue. And I'm going to go over the panels. I'm just going to leave the cracks between them not uh, painted in Dunkelblau. I'm also going to, wherever I put damage, try not to fill in the center of the damage, so the center of the craters or the scrapes or whatever, so that that stays dark as well. Um, this is just a pretty simple fill-in-the-dots kind of process. Be a little cautious because uh, the, as we move forward, the lighter colors, the, if you get any lighter colors into the cracks, you're going to lose definition on the surface of the model. And really, these battle mechs don't have a lot of they don't have a lot of detail or texture to sort of differentiate them from being just one big slab of color or whatever camouflage scheme you put over top. I will admit the 13th Deneagle Guards being all a dark blue is not exactly the most interesting color scheme. Um, but I chose it for thematic reasons because I'm going to be making different units later, which hopefully will make it onto this channel as well. But yeah, it, you know, it, there's not a lot of detail if you don't take the time to 
line out the panels and let the panels at least divide things up and give you some visual interest. So do try to uh, be a little careful about the cracks between panels. And you can see here, um, th these are a bunch of the bullet holes that we made earlier. They're crackling up a little bit. I'm sorry this is a little out of focus. I had some issues with focus for a lot of this video, so let me just apologize now as a, a tangent, but yeah. Um, you can see it's crackling up a little bit, and we're just leaving the centers dark. And that gives us a pretty simple, like, honestly, if you just cut it off there, you'd have a paint scheme. But we're going to carry on. So I wanted to do something a little, I don't know, I'd seen some pictures on Instagram of people who, like, heavily weathered their models. Um, normally Warhammer models and stuff like that. And I wanted to see if I could make that kind of thing work. Um, and this was a, a bit of a, a misadventure, as the title indicates. I do end up going back on this, so if you just want to skip this, you can, and you can go to the next section. Um, but if you're interested, you know, in the, the process, because I, I'm, I'm as fallible as anyone, um, if not more than some, uh, you know, follow along. So the first thing I did was I got some of this model color white. Now, this is a really old paint that I had kicking around. I'm just starting to burn through some old Vallejo paints I had. Um, and you'll see it's super, super watery, and obviously being on a wet palette is not going to help that. So it's incredibly thin um and that made it super hard to work with i'm gonna try using the dunkelblau and a little bit of this white and uh just to you know make it a little paler and what i'm going for is uh paint chipping that's what i'm gonna try and do here for for quote unquote weathering effects is i'm just gonna try and chip away areas now you could use a chipping medium i've learned recently on different projects that i've been doing um Actually, if you check me out on Instagram or on Patreon, you will see some of those uh, projects. Very exciting commission work. Unfortunately, they aren't going to make it to YouTube because I wasn't recording while I was working on it. I was trying to get this commission work done in time for the customer. But anyway, I, I did learn about chipping medium recently. But at the time that I was doing this, I had never tried it. So I tried to just do chipping by painting, which, like I said, I've seen from really good painters on Instagram. Suffice to say, uh, this was an experiment and uh, yeah, I probably could have done better. So I tried this, and it was way too thin, and this light blue, when I tried applying it, just wouldn't uh, it wouldn't take shapes. It flowed across the whole panel, it went right into the cracks, and made the cracks way too light. Um, and it was really uh, not holding its own. So I uh, tried this blending gel, uh, slow-drying blending gel. Now, uh, this is a, a product for acrylic painting, sort of on canvas and that kind of stuff. But I'd heard this kind of thing could work reasonably well for models. Um... I decided to give it a shot here, and, and just it did thicken up the paint, which let me apply it a little bit better. But the slow drying made it look really glossy as well, which made it kind of hard to tell what I was doing when it was just shining in the light. Um, so this was another experiment that I think I'll, I'll follow up on this medium in other projects and try and find a different use for it. But in this case, it wasn't really what I was looking for. Uh, you'll see in the next uh, section here, as I start trying to apply this, I'm going to take it over and I'm going to I'm trying to make these little you can see the chips, right? Like the little dots where paint might have chipped from something, you know, atmospheric re-entry or shrapnel or, or machine gun rounds or whatever around the edges of panels and little scrapes across the panels and stuff like that. And with the slow dry medium, it was kind of applying okay, but the texture was a bit weird and I get the feeling it's supposed to be used for larger areas like canvases. Um, it's not really coming off the paintbrush very smoothly and I ended up struggling with it for quite a while and putting on more and more and more and I got this sort of polka dotted effect uh, that really wasn't what I was looking for. So now I'm going back in and I'm just putting that Dunkelblau over everything. And I'm going to restart this um, sans the paint chipping. So now I'm going to go in and I'm going to highlight it for real. Uh, I've decided to go with a much more plain paint scheme. Just because I, I, I didn't think the chipping was translating that well at tabletop distance when I did it in small areas. So I got carried away and put it everywhere and then it wasn't translating very well at all. It looked like a, a kind of hodgepodge camo scheme. And like a snowfall camo scheme is pretty cool. If you play Mech Warrior online, I really like the snowfall camo, but this wasn't that. So anyway, I'm going to go over to get my Vallejo Flow Improver. I have mentioned Vallejo Flow Improver on the channel before. Basically, it's, uh, it's meant to improve the flow of things through an airbrush by reducing its surface tension and letting it flow smoother. Um, but I'm going to use it here to get a really, really smooth blend of white paint and blue paint, this uh, this blend that I'm going to use to 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 make the highlights on the panels. Uh, and then with these highlights, I'm going to be much more controlled. It's just going to be panel edges, sort of an edge highlight, but not like small and really really fine. Um, but just going and sort of keeping in mind. For my part, I tried to imagine that the light was coming from the top right of the model. So every once in a while, I would hold it and look at it from that direction and think about what panel edges or what areas would be touched by my gaze, like what can I see? 
and that's what would be highlighted. So I went through and just highlighted the panel edges and you can see what I mean now, I think, hopefully, about the panels being really the only detail in the model. So you want to pick those out and you want to make those stand out. And all of a sudden you get what looks like a much denser model, um, despite it being largely flat areas of largely flat color. For the details on the model, I'm talking weapons, uh, joints, all these gray areas. Um, this paint scheme is, you know, dark, desaturated blue and gray. Um, so it, yeah, we're gonna go over and I'm just making, this is a really simple blend. It's white and black into a dark gray, like very dark gray. I'm looking not quite black, but uh, just off black, if that makes any sense. And I am gonna highlight this later to pull it out a little bit more, but I'm just gonna put that on pretty much every area we haven't colored yet. All the joints, the feet, the guns, um, that kind of stuff is all going to get hit with this dark gray. And now the color is starting to come together between that and the highlights, I was pretty happy with it. I'm also going to go into the actual weapon impacts, and I'm going to assume that, you know, there's metal underneath showing from it having been impacted, and that metal is going to be this dark gray color as well. Um, I'm, you could use a metallic paint in there, but at this scale, I think it would look too shiny. Uh, like, it would be very, very shiny in that small area, and I don't think it would look all that great. Uh, not for me, anyway. Next, I'm going to grab just a little more white, mix it in with that dark gray, and I'm going to pick up all of the raised edges. I'm going to use the exact same technique for highlighting, so if I were looking at it from the top right, what edges do I see, what are the edges that are facing me, and therefore receiving light, and those are the ones that I'm going to hit with highlights. Uh, two levels of highlight might be enough for you, but I'm going to go in and do a third later in the video as well. Uh, I try to keep everything to three layers of color because that seems to be, at the scale of miniatures anyway, a gradient that fools the human eye pretty well. You know, a dark color, a mid-color, a highlight color. That's why I think uh, if you look at standard painting that's recommended by pros, it often comes in three or more layers, not just two. So I'm sticking with three for this one. But now we're going to go on to jeweling. Now, jeweling and lensing is sort of the more the most expansive part of this video, and it's not necessarily because there's that much to know about it, but it's because uh, if you haven't done it, I felt it would be useful to show you the whole process from start to finish. Um, so hopefully this helps somebody, especially beginners who are just getting into this, and helps you sort of get more confident in painting the lasers, the weapons, uh, the, the canopies of battle mechs. Because uh, that was a little intimidating for me, but when you do a flat color on it, it doesn't look that great And if you try to highlight and shade it like it's a solid surface, it's also not necessarily looking like a canopy So jeweling really to make something look like it's glowing from the inside is an effect that I use pretty frequently And I think it's pretty cool So I've dedicated a whole bunch of the video to this Hopefully you can follow along with what I'm doing on my palette and what I'm doing in real time So I'm mixing a little bit of blue green into this just to give a little more color variety I guess so this is royal blue and blue green and some white uh, and I just want to get a color that is not quite like it's it's different enough from the blue of the body that it stands out and this is gonna be for the particle projector cannons if you play Battletech it's a sort of blue lightning shooting gun um, so there are three of them on the awesome so I'm gonna be painting them all with this gradient that I'm making here and, and to make the gradient I'm streaking in black from one side white from the other side and the color I want for the weapon in the center and I'm just working back and forth to make everything sort of blended together and I'm going to work from that as I apply it to the model itself, to the um, the areas I want to jewel. By doing this, it means that all of it came from the same colors and all of it is in the same sort of family of color, if that makes sense. Uh, so I'm not like remixing it every time and getting slightly different colors between the layers. It should all look really unified and really fool the eye. So I'm starting with really dark, not quite the black, but just one step removed from the black, the black and blue interaction zone. And I'm going to put that in the base of all of these uh, particle projector cannons. And we're going to work with all of this while it's still wet, because by doing so, it's going to sort of help everything blend together. They'll bleed into each other and they'll make the transitions between the layers a lot smoother. So I'm mixing in a little bit of this flow improver regularly onto my brush. Not enough to make the brush wet, but enough to make everything just run a little more. So now I grabbed some color from the center and I'm trying to apply it really, really lightly just as a dot in the center and let it flow outwards. Um, you, if you see it pooling a little bit, eh, you know, you decide if it looks good. For me, if it pooled a little bit around the bottom, that's fine because it's sort of like a glow from the weapon. There's just a little bit of light being projected on the bottom of the weapon well. But, you know, to each their own, decide if you like how it turns out. So again, I'm going to wash off most of the color from the brush using that flow improver, and now while the brush is still wet from it, I'm going into the lighter area, the light blue, 
And again, I'm just going to put in the tiniest dot because these are tiny areas, you know. So if you go heavy handed and you let too much ink flow in, uh, you know, like if you're, it's too wet and it flows everywhere or if you just smash your paintbrush into it, it's going to flow everywhere and it's going to overwhelm everything and you're going to lose the gradient effect and then eh, the jeweling didn't work. Um, so you, you want to be building up from dark to light and a really, really smooth gradient. You can see that best in the right hand chest particle projector cannon, the one that's sort of you know, closest to us and most in focus right now, it's working right there. And I hope you can see that. The outside is darker, but it's got a little bit of a glow and it's coming in towards the center, which is really hot, really well lit. And I'm just working from darker to lighter. And you kind of want to do as many layers as you can to get as smooth of a gradient as you can. So here I'm, I grabbed more white and I mixed it with a little more blue and I'm going again with an even paler color. And you know, as long as you're not overwhelming your jeweled area, the more of these individual layers of color you can put on, the better it is. Ultimately, it's those multiple layers, one on top of the other, that's going to give your sort of jeweled and lit areas depth. And it's depth that's going to make them appear realistic, I guess. Um, and the very last thing is a dot of basically pure white, as small as possible, as centered as possible. Another application for this is for coils. So in this case, uh, it's like the... Um, these are plasma coils. If you do Warhammer, I don't really, but I guess they've got plasma guns or something. They tend to have these coils on top. You can do the exact same process for making a glowing effect on those uh, by putting in, again, that same gradient and trying to focus it in between the sort of crossbars here. So I'm going dark, then I'm going mid, and the mid is going to be focused on that area between the crossbars within that sort of grill just to, to lighten it up and working closer and closer to the center of each area with every layer. Um, I'm sorry, it's so out of focus. Hopefully you're getting the idea anyway. It keeps trying to focus on my thumb or something and then it pulls out and then it, now it's decided the back of the, the miniature is in focus. And unfortunately, while I'm doing this kind of stuff, uh, it's kind of fiddly work. So I'm, I'm paying attention to what I'm doing and then I look over at the camera and I'm like, ah, dang it. <laughs> so uh, hopefully you're getting the idea though. Now I'm putting the lighter one and the lighter one is focused into an even smaller area within those lit areas. Um, all building up to just make that glowing effect. So this has been sort of a really in-depth look into making those laser effects. Um, and now this is sort of what it looks like afterwards. Uh, you can see that glow is just so nice. And I'm using the time while it dries to apply another highlight to the gray areas. Just throw that in wherever you can. Finally, I'm going to put that same sort of glowing effect on the canopy. Um, and that, that canopy for the, the battle mech in this case, for the awesome, is very small. Um, it's very uh, centralized and it's a tiny slit, so you want to be, again, careful with this. There are some battle mechs with a much larger canopy, and you'll see some pictures at the end here, the examples of other mechs I've done that have larger canopies. Uh, it's the same idea. I did the same steps, just over a larger area and trying to spread that gradient out, so probably with more layers. So again, what I've done here is I've gone and I've taken... Well, first the red paint, and I'm just putting it in uh, to the small laser on top of its head. Just a little dot there. There's not enough room to really jewel it. And then for the canopy, I've made a gradient of black to orange, and I'm putting in that dark color first, the very nearly black but not quite uh, blend of black and orange. Come on. There we go. The focus. Um, and I'm just slapping that into the areas. And what that does, obviously, is it makes the dark areas around the edges that we're going to be inserting everything else into afterwards, but it also hydrates the whole area. And that's what's going to help our um, paint sort of blend outwards and, like I said, leach into each other as we go on. Once I've done that dark area, I'm going back in and I'm grabbing a little bit lighter, closer to the mid-tone of the orange that I'm looking for. Um, and I'm going to bring that back, and because the whole area is quite wet, in this case my base was quite uh, fluid, um, I just need to sort of touch my paintbrush against the bottom of the canopy. I'm doing it from the bottom so that it looks like it's glowing upwards, like the, um, the consoles or something are glowing upwards and that's visible. And I'm using orange, uh, not only because it's a complementary color to blue, but uh, if you color theorists out there notice that, then uh, congratulations, but of course... That's not, uh, I'm probably gonna do orange for my other battle mechs, even if the battle mech is some sort of color of red as well. Um, so it's not uh, some sort of color theory genius trick. It's actually just that um, in the books, they tend to describe the consoles and the heads up display for the battle mechs as being amber or orange colored or yellow colored. So I'm just going with orange because I think orange looks a little more aggressive and interesting than yellow. Um, so now I'm going in with the light orange and this light orange is sort of fading up again from the bottom. I'm just tapping it into the bottom, letting it sort of drain its way upwards to the top. 
and outwards and that that drop that fluid within the background is just pushing everything outwards and the background of dark paint is getting pushed into the corners and making the edges blend forward like this darkness to light it's really fantastic like i'm, I'm i put all this time in to show you that a this is basically real time this is how long it takes to do this it's not that long and it looks really cool. It looks way cooler than doing a flat painted canopy. So honestly, if you're thinking about picking up Battletech and you're thinking about painting your battle mechs, do yourself a favor and just try this. Finally here, uh, I'm not going all the way to white with this because I'm not trying to make it look perfectly glowy, but hey, that was white and orange and it makes it look, it just pops out, man. It, it's awesome. It's awesome. So yeah, you know, if you're a beginner picking up Battletech, honestly, try that um, on your own models. And uh, I guarantee you, you will like it. Now I'm just grabbing some burnt umber and I'm not going to have paletto vision here because I'm not mixing it with anything. This is just straight up burnt umber model air paint and I'm throwing that on the bases. Not too complicated, nothing too crazy. Um, the one thing you might want to do is maybe go in with a couple of coats if you're worried about all your brown looking the same and you for some reason put on your texture paint after your uh, primer like I did. Uh, so that the texture paint's brown doesn't sort of offset the brown of whatever mud you're putting on and make it stand out. Uh, if you had cat litter on the base, just like I did, you could also leave some of that exposed to make it look like gray rock. Um, that's also pretty nice. Now what I'm doing is, it, it, I call it a pin wash, but I, I think pin wash probably has some more technical meaning for really professional, like, you know, top-notch painters. I think they've got a really specific way of doing pin washes. But what I'm doing here is I've got a really thin brush, and I've got my uh, homemade wash, which I've used in previous videos. It's basically just Vallejo Flow and Brewer, a little bit of water and a little bit of black ink. There's nothing, there's no real crazy science here. And I'm just applying it super, super lightly into the cracks and the crevices and the panel lines and stuff like that. I don't want to make them look black. Right, like I've talked earlier, I want my shadows to be bluish, but I do want to make all of those dark areas sort of stand out a little bit more. So just a little bit of this wash in the uh, recesses will just, again, push that texture out, push those panels out and give you more depth on what would otherwise be a really flat plane miniature. And now here for flocking, I've got Mod Podge glue. Um, I tried using other glues, uh, like a cheaper white glue, and it ended up drying cloudy and looking kind of awful so i don't recommend it um although mod podge is more expensive so it seems like a shame to use it for this use mod podge um and then for flock i've got some actual flocking from woodland scenics i've got some like little clump foliage i think it's called it's basically just sponge colored and torn up um and then i've got uh, some dill in there as well uh dill and oregano have become kind of my best friends for flocking because they're are really cheap if you've got a bulk barn or some other bulk store nearby and they've got a really good look to them they got a rich color you just want to make sure you seal them in really well so the smell doesn't get out so they don't rot and uh, so their color stays good they don't like you know wilt in UV light or something like that but I've got all that blended together because using just one color of flock really makes a flat color uh, for your grass and this just gives a little more dynamic look to it just glue it on, slap that on, you know, tap it on um, so that it, it comes out sort of standing up and not just all flat and sad, but standing up a little bit like grass. And then uh, you got your base. So that's black flow acrylic. And I'm putting that around the edges of the base. I'm doing that after I varnished everything. I didn't record varnishing, unfortunately, um, but just varnish sometimes it sort of sprays everywhere and then it gets on my, my camera. Um, but I recommend varnishing. I varnished with an airbrush again. I just used my usual Liquitex. Um, I think in this case I did a gloss varnish to retain the color and then a little bit of a matte varnish just to knock down the gloss so it doesn't look like a shiny toy soldier. Um, but I always apply a varnish, you know, I intend to use my miniatures for playing games and if you're going to be gaming, you're going to be touching them, you're going to be moving around and dropping them. Sealing in your paint job seems like a good idea to me, I don't know. I know a lot of people don't do it because it can affect how the miniature looks and how its colors are, but in my case I find it's worth it. And uh, in some cases the matte varnish makes things look better anyway, so. Apply the varnish and then put something around the edge of the base to make the base look nice and black and clean again. And there you go. That's the battle mech done. Um, so here's the, the sort of full glory shot roll of all of the battle mechs I painted this way. That's the whole box of armored combat and one of the beginner box set models, the griffin in the back corner there. Um, all of them, you know, these are uh, these are all painted 
quote unquote 13th Denegal Guards. I'm going to paint up some other guys as the 4th Deneb Light Cavalry if you're interested in Battletech, because um, they were adversaries during the Federated Commonwealth Civil War. And for those of you who don't like Battletech, this is that just went right over your head. But hey, it's got some pretty cool books, the older books more than the new books, if I do say so myself. It's got some interesting rules. It's basically like a role playing game crossed with a war game for the amount of detail. So it's funner for smaller battles than bigger battles, otherwise, it takes way too long. Um, but it's fun, and the new mini the new models are fantastic, and I'm really looking forward to the Kickstarter turning out the uh, the models they promised for that. So anyway, I hope that was interesting to you. I hope you learned something, and I hope this helps beginners and people who are just getting interested in BattleTech uh, to paint your models uh, in a quick, easy, and really, to my opinion, visually attractive way. If this helped you, if you found this interesting, and uh, if you'd like to follow along with this channel, uh, please consider subscribing, liking the video, that kind of stuff. Uh, if you have any questions, if you got any comments, if you got anything like that, throw it down in the, the comment section. Um, I read them all, and uh, I frequently respond whenever there is something to say, so if you got questions, I would love to answer them. Um, I did mention earlier in the video, I do have a Patreon now. It's, uh, you know, down in the description. Uh, if you do want to support me, that would be very, very, very much appreciated. Um, I'll list off your name in the videos and stuff like that, so that's cool. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for watching, and go play some games.